I say they'd be an accurate reflection of what you would have everyone hear. Amen. All right, we are continuing this sermon series called Rise and Fall. We are going through First and Second Samuel. And, and to kind of catch you up to where we are today, we remember that, um, that, that Samuel was kind of like the last judge, kind of. It's complicated. Like, and and the, all the people, uh, all the Lord's people were like, we want a king like all the other nations have. We want a king. And, and God told Samuel after he heard this, he goes, Samuel, it's not you, it's me. Right? It's not you that they're upset about, that they, they, are, they are neglecting me. They are going away from me. And so, so God raises up the first king, King Saul right it's it's great but we see chinks in his armor from the very beginning remember he was never able to find his donkeys i won't go back into those jokes about him not being able, never mind and so so he he wasn't able to it's like he wasn't a good shepherd but he had a quick rise and then he has this fall right and remember what the beginning of the fall was really for for um saul is that god told him to completely obliterate the Amalekites. All right, we got to talk about that just for a second here. When we talk about God obliterating something, don't get caught on that part of the story right now. That's another sermon we can deal with that. There's a lot of troubling things. Remember, it's not our culture, not all that stuff. But God told him to completely destroy the Amalekites, and he didn't do it. And he didn't do it because like, he was like, oh, those poor Amalekites, I'm going to have compassion on them. No, he saw that he could make more wealth, more power, and more people could look at how amazing he is because he built this giant idol to himself. They didn't call it an idol, but a statue to himself. By the way, we're going to do some fundraisers so that we can build a big idol to me out here. <laughs> like Just so that you guys know, about it, it's going to be me holding like a hermit crab. And uh, like that, that's so the whole world will know. And uh, but so he builds this big thing, and and that's when kind of the Lord decides like this: we got to go a different way. We got to go a different way. And the, it says the word of the Lord left Saul, and he goes and he sees David, and he anoints David, even though David's the youngest of his brothers. And we see David kind of come up. We begin to see David rise. And we see David's really kind of comes into prominence as he defeats Goliath. Remember, as a young boy, he defeats Goliath there. And it comes up. And we, last week we talked about Saul like going, uh, like he cut, David cut Saul's robe with, with a knife and showed it to him outside of a cave saying, I could have killed you and, and I didn't. And today we're talking about things of the future. And things of the future, and 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 that this is something that can be difficult for us. It can be a challenge. Like, how do we deal with the future? How do we how do we do all these things? And some of you, I have been included in this, how, can have a lot of consternation about the future. It's like, what does the future hold? We got to seize the future and take it. Well, in our reading today, we see kind of two in our in our study today. We kind of see two different aspects of the future. And this is everything that we're going over today. So buckle up. We're going to be here till 4 p.m. <laughs> and we'll just go straight into the crab racing because we're going through 28 through chapter 2, 2 Samuel chapter 6. That's kind of what, if you're going to read something in part of this, read this section today because it's fascinating because what we see is Saul becomes enamored with his future. So enamored with his future that he's scared of it. He fears it beyond anything else. He's so scared of what is going to happen that it begins to act kind of irrationally at all the situations around him. So one of the things Saul did, and, this is in, and it says this at the beginning of chapter 28, it says Samuel has died. All Israel had mourned with him. And Saul, during this time, he also, he's kind of setting up the story, Saul expelled all the mediums and all those spiritists out of the land. So he's got, he got rid of all these, these kind of sinful things over there. But the problem is Saul's afraid. Saul's afraid. He's looking out from his kingdom and he sees on the edge of the kingdoms, he sees the Philistines. And the Philistines are hitting these drums of war. And, and Saul can kind of feel the weight of his future. It's almost like he can tell that he can die, right? And he's, and he's afraid about it. 
And he, and he prays, and his prayers come back completely empty. Like he's, he's like, what's, what's going on? I can't, I don't know what's happening. I need to be able to see my future. I need to know what is going on. I need to tell my family not to text me during sermons. That's what, that's my, that's what my, 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 my phone's going off. That'll be the future for them. And, uh, <laughs> and so, so, so he's so he's scared, he's afraid. And he looks at his men, at his attendants, and he goes, hey, remember, remember when we did that righteous thing and got rid of all the mediums and all that stuff? Remember when we did that? It's like, I need you guys to find one. Can you find me one? Sir, you got rid of all those. Like, come on, there's something. You're like, all right, we'll go over there. We, f- we found one in the land of Star Wars, and it's like there's this witch of Endor. Sounds like a Star Wars character, right? Like that's that's like that's where like Yoda was before Luke found him. Like he's hanging out with the Witch of Endor. Like that's my, my friends are in, in 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 the crowd today. Big Star Wars fans. I like it, not that much. Anyway, so so he goes to the he goes to this Witch Witch of Endor to seek what's going to happen in the future. Because he's like, if I could just talk to Samuel once more. Then, then everything will be okay. If I could just see what's going on, everything will be great. And so he goes to this medium and indoor, and he's like, bring back Samuel. She's like, can it just be a little easier? Like I can, I can bring back anybody else, right? Like this, someone like, let's not do Samuel. Samuel's pretty righteous. He's like, no, I want Samuel. And she brings him back, and Samuel comes up comes up out of kind of the grave, out of the ground, and you can see what's happening. Here's a photograph of the event that day. And I guess everyone looks very medieval and white, which was odd for back then, but you know. But like that's, but you have, you have over here, and, and, the, and everyone's just terrified of this. And, so, and Samuel like, like quotes, quotes that, uh, like, like the genie's temple from Aladdin. He's like, who disturbs my slumber, right? No one else? All right. So, so he, so he, um, Samuel's like, why have you awakened me? There's something I want you to notice. I'm, and I talked in first service about this way more than I'm going to here. But notice where Samuel comes from. I encourage you to read this this week. He comes from Sheol, comes from the grave, comes from down below like oftentimes our thinking of like the afterlife and all that stuff is all like oh samuel was good and so he went to heaven right those are our kind of conventions our hope of salvation in god is that god will never leave us or forsake us it's not it's not about it's not about our it's not about our um how good we are or anything like that. The faith isn't even about just going to heaven, but it's about God never leaving us behind. And so when we see these stories about Saul coming up from the grave, that's just there, that's you're seeing that culture and that time and space, what they thought happened to the dead right there. And so he comes back and he's like, why have you awakened me? And Saul's like, I need your help. Like the Philistines are banging these drums of war. I need you, Samuel. And then Samuel doesn't say anything new to Saul. He goes, Saul, you've ruined it. All you've been, all you've cared about is control. Your entire time you've been king. All you've cared about is the glory of the office of king. That's all you've cared about. God has already decided he's going to go with this guy named David. Like you're, you've been left behind. And Samuel then goes away. And, and this story at the end of Saul's life is so interesting. It's so fascinating. Like, like, normally when you hear about the ends of king's reigns, it's like some big pomp and circumstance, right? It's like whenever you watch like a medieval movie and it's talking about a great king, like this, this king like did all these huge like movements and all these huge things and made all this happen. And then he dies on the battlefield in this heroic fashion. That's not what happens to Saul. Saul kind of, 
kind of goes out like a candle in the wind type of thing. Like, you know how we have the candles set up on Good Friday and we kind of slowly blow them out? It's kind of like Samuel's life kind of goes out like that last. It's like in this small manner, it seems, that kind of darkness comes. And because we see like they're battling, they're battling on, the, on this field with the Philistines and the Philistines pull back their bows and they shoot the arrows up into the air and they all come down and they strike, they strike Saul. And Saul's like, oh, here it is. Here it is, and, and Saul looks over at his armor bearer, and he says, draw your sword and run, run me through. Like, don't let these uncircumcised fellows like, come and run me through and abuse me. Like, you do it. In that moment, we see that Saul is doing exactly the same thing he's always done. He's always been terrified of his future that may happen. He's always been terrified of what's going to happen. And and he's like, you do it. I don't want these other people to hurt me. And the guy's like, I'm not going to kill the king, man. That's a sure way of dying. And so Saul took his own life and fell on his own sword. The future can be difficult. And we don't often know what's going on with it. And I, I can sympathize with what Saul is saying. That Saul, Saul has said all, like, he, you can tell he's just constantly concerned about the future. He's like, I gotta make sure I make all this just right. And I gotta make sure the future happens perfectly. And I can tell you that I have had times in my life where I didn't know what the next day was gonna be. And I'll tell you what the big one was for me. It was, it was March of 2020. I, re- I remember sitting here. I, was at, I don't know where I was. I may have been at home. I, w- I may have been in the church. Remember, this was before we had the big office. I mean, the big, the, that's my, just that's my office over there. <laughs> like over there. It's before we had the new building and all that stuff. And remember, I had to share an office with, with Kevin. You remember that? Man, the levels I go, right? He's not even here to defend himself. He was yelling stuff back at me in the first service. He's watching them from the office right now. But like, like, I, like I remember sitting, sitting there and I was like, like, man, what if all this collapses? What, what if no one is able to work and make money? And like, these are all things that we were all concerned about. And, and, like, and if the members of the church are having to like, use their last dollars to buy beans so they can survive, they're not going to be like, here's 10% of my beans, pastor, right? Like, they're, they're not, they're not going to be doing that. And I, and I was like, well, what's going to happen with me? What's going to happen with the church here? What's going to happen with all this stuff? And I remember I had a real moment of like, oh, oh, dang. I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to survive this. And, 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 it, and, it, and it really worried me there for a little bit, and I was thinking about my future. And um, I have to be honest with you guys just a little bit about our website for a second, all right? So the Grace's website, you can comment on everything. Cheryl, like a couple weeks ago, you commented on one of the articles and all that stuff. As soon as I saw Cheryl's comment, I hit approve on it because I don't show all the comments that show up because there's a lot of like, people that want to sell stuff. There's people that want to do, do things like that. But there's also the comments that I will describe as the political ones, right? Then they, and they range the gamut. The, some of my favorite ones that I've seen have been ones that say, all you guys do in that church is worship the orange beast. We know who they're talking about, right? Like that's, 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 that's that. No, I don't want to show it. And, uh, and so then, but then the other ones are like from the more conservative side and, and, they, and they'll go like, oh, why, why aren't you like doing things just this way? And there's, a, there's an interesting through line on those. And this is what I want to talk about. That all of those end up, everyone that I've seen almost, all end up and they start talking about concern for the church. They're like, if we don't turn around, if we don't get things in order, if we don't like, take control of our future, to quote our sermon series today, then the church is going to die. And I believe we're at a precipice and the church will just fade into oblivion forever. 
And, and I'm amazed at how those usually come in into that, into that moment. And, and it's speaking of a real angst of what's going to happen to the church. You know, and as we look at David here at the beginning of 2 Samuel, as we look at David in the beginning of him, there's this weird sense that David isn't concerned about the future. David doesn't seem to be concerned. It seems like when we first meet David and he's fighting Goliath, as he's got his sling and his stone, it's almost like David doesn't care if he dies or not. He's like, well, let's see if this works. You know? It's like, oh, hey, it worked out. You know, like that's like that seems to be David's way. And you look and see, like, what from what we know about like medieval king movies is that people are always trying to fight each other, try to get who has the most power, right? It's like if I could somehow kill the king, then I would reign supreme. Like that's kind of how we see. But David doesn't do that. So Saul kind of dies out on the field, and this one guy comes up to David. And he tells them, this one foreign guy comes out to tell, tells David, hey, Saul is dead. And what David does, he doesn't go, woohoo, like sings a jig, like all that stuff. No, he does his best Hulk Hogan from the 80s impersonation and rips his clothing in mourning. He, ripped, he rips him up. He's like, the king's anointed is dead. That's backwards. And then I want, so for those of you that read ahead, um, the guy who tells David that, uh, that the king died, he's a certain nationality. Does anyone remember off the top of their head what that nationality is? Bible study, hold your votes. Does anyone remember? All right, Bible study. Do you remember? Amalekites. Amalekites. Who was Saul supposed to utterly destroy? The Amalekites. So get past like the whole destroying thing. Like, yes, that's that's weird part of the story. But look at the poetic sense to this. Is that it's an Amalekite that comes and tells David. A guy, according to the story, shouldn't be there. It's this kind of weird sense. And David you think he would sing a jig and all that stuff, but Dave, that's not how David goes. He's basically like, so you killed him? Like, the blood be on your own head. That you, your mouth is testified against what you said when you said that I killed the Lord's anointed. Like, that's, like that, it's this weird poetic sense to it, right? But as we go forward into all of this, all the rest of the story, and read this, like, I don't have time. I'm already 18 minutes into the sermon. I can't go past much longer than this. But 2 Samuel 1 through 5 is David coming, and you can tell that everything he's doing, he isn't concerned about the future. He's not concerned about where this next thing's going to come. All he concerns about is like, how can we join people together? And in these five short chapters here, we go from the death of Saul to David unifying the whole kingdom together. All these people that were following Saul, all these people that are following David, all these people that are following Ishboseth and all these other, all these other names of people. David works with them, not killing people. It's like, did you ever like Saul? Off with your head. I'm putting people, you know, loyalist in, in my thing. No, he's like, you like Saul? That's great. Come follow me as well, right? And he brings them all together. It's almost like he's not concerned about the future. It's almost like he's concerned with unifying everyone together. And what we're going to see next week is that this all leads into this big, huge kingly promise that, that, the, that, that the Messiah line goes through David. But David unifies everything together. And, and as I was writing the sermon here today, I almost didn't want to tell you this part of it, but because it made it sound a little bit like I was like the winner here, and that's not my intention. But remember what I said earlier about that time when I felt the most scared about the future and not knowing what was going to happen next. And, and I was like, well, if that's the way it's going to be, 
then other people are probably going to feel that same way. And so, well, let's find ways that we can just take care of people. Because people are going to be lonely. People aren't going to be able to see others. All those things. And so we started crafting this church in a way to just take care of people in the midst of the pandemic. We did communion service, but we didn't do communion service. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of like bringing down other churches here. We didn't do just drive-through stuff where people got their, got their little good luck token and their little thimble of wine, right? No, we treated communion like it was communion. People would come in at organized times that we still do to this day, by the way, and they would come and talk outside, then they would come in safely in here, and we would have human interaction for like 15 minutes with each family because communion wasn't just about getting this magic token, but it was about being together with the body of Christ. We got, <coughs> we got Diane and Linda Gannon to call everyone in the congregation once a week. That these people that were alone in, the, in, in their homes and lonely and had no one to reach out to, we got them to do that. We got people to send cards out to others and all these, all these things. We just, we, all we cared about was making sure people were okay. And, and I don't know why, but we got through the pandemic really well. We grew in numbers. And, and I look back at like how, how scared I was that day. And I was just concerned about my own selfishness. And, and when we started together, bending in to watching other people, we were okay. We were fine. It could have all collapsed. And you know what? We would have collapsed helping our neighbor. And that would have been fine. When people talk about how they're so worried about the church dying, that we're losing our place in society, that we don't know which way is up, we don't, it's all gonna go away. The only thing I can think of is that the church is the body of Christ. That we are the body of Christ in this place. And as far as I know of the story of Jesus, the body of Jesus literally, that he, that body has already died. And three days later, it rose again. And if God made that happen to God made flesh, then it could happen with the body of Christ that is in this place and around us as well. We don't have to worry. Because God is with us and sustaining us. And he sustained David and he sustained in, in these times, he sustained this church, he sustained most of the churches in this country and in the world. And he'll continue to sustain you. Not because you do everything right, not because you've done all that, but because God died and rose again so I could say these simple words to you. You'll be okay. And I think that's good news. And we'll end right there. Let's say a prayer. Jesus, we thank you that you love us and you're with us. Lord, when we begin to have concern and worry in this world, when things seem all topsy-turvy, when we think the things that we love are gonna die out, Lord, help us to see how you are sustaining us, how you are sustaining the church. Lord, make us just as Christ said, your will be done. Lord, let us say that as we go in and show love to all of our neighbors. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much for supporting.